Seth MacFarlane, one of the most influential figures in all of history. Someone who I've talked about a fair amount on my channel. But this man, he, he's just created so many beloved and famous things that I doubt I could ever run out of topics relating to him. Being interested in art and animation from a very young age, Seth first got to start drawing comics for his local newspapers, as far back as the age of 11. If you go back and check out some of these, you gotta admit, for an 11 year old, this stuff ain't that bad. After breaking out into the industry to work on shows such as Cotton Chicken, Johnny Bravo, and Dexter's Laboratory, Seth worked his way up the ladder and got the chance to create his very own animated television series at only 24. Since then, he's gone on to create three beloved- th Three shows, a live-action Star Trek parody, and arguably Seth's biggest creative endeavor of his career, his attempt at breaking out into film. As of today, Seth has three films under his belt, with the latest one, Ted 2, being released seven years ago in 2015. So I think it's safe to say that he's been taking a break from the big screen. But why is that? Clearly, he must have made some kind of good impression to be given three whole chances. Most people don't even get one. So just what went wrong here to cause him to take a step back from filmmaking? Well, I think the best way to go about this would obviously be to take a look at all three of Seth MacFarlane's films to see just what happened. Did his comedic writing not translate well to live action? Was it due to poor direction? Did people just want to see Family Guy the movie? Let's find out. Starting with Seth MacFarlane's big directorial debut, Ted. Dude, you have no fucking idea how hyped I was for Ted. The second I saw the trailer and the words from the creator of Family Guy appeared on screen, I was hooked. I had to see this movie. August could not come any faster. This was the worst, most long-feeling wait I've ever had for a film. The only thing that came anywhere close was Wreck-It Ralph. Yes, it's because Sonic was in it. But it was a good movie too, okay? But August finally came. I got all ready to go to the theater and see the funny man Seth MacFarlane on the big screen and... Oh wait, I'm 10 years old. Well, that's okay. That, that just means I can watch it when it releases on DVD in almost three months. And then I had to wait till Christmas. But boy, I have to say, the wait was fucking worth it. I adored this film as a kid. It was my favorite movie ever made for a while. I'd quote it all the time, listen through all the bonus DVD content. I even had the Ted app on my iPad, which was clearly just an adult ripoff of Talking Tom. But to be fair, I also thought Family Guy was the best thing ever as a kid. I'm the kid who cried when they killed off Brian Griffin, so it could be possible. And now this is a stretch. But it could be possible this thing I enjoyed as a kid isn't very good. Blasphemy, I know. But I'm going to try to go into this without any of my preconceived opinions. To try and objectively see if this was or wasn't a good movie. So without further ado, here we have Ted. Ted has a very basic premise. This kid called John gets a teddy bear for Christmas and wishes on a shooting star that he could become real. Which he does. And we fast forward to see just how much John has been screwing up his life by living with a talking teddy bear. Honestly, I'm glad they just bullshit their way through him coming to life. Magic. Ooh, magic. Allows the plot to move along quite nicely. But honestly, the movie isn't even really that much about Ted. It's actually way more focused on John, with his girlfriend of four years trying to show him that he'll never grow up as long as he keeps his teddy bear around. Very obviously being a metaphor for needing to leave your childhood things in the past and grow up. That's probably the first thing I'd point out about this movie. Despite the wild marketing campaign, trying to advertise this thing as the most wacky, raunchy talking bear movie ever made. At its core, it's a very grounded and heartfelt love triangle movie. John has to pick between his lifelong friend or his girlfriend, and they put a large focus on that struggle he faces with his temptations. Maybe the way I'm wording that makes it sound all serious and deep, but no, not at all. This is the same movie that spans a two minute scene pointing out how someone has shit in the floor. But I think it's worth pointing out, as it goes to show that Seth not only wanted to make a good comedy movie here, but also just a solid film in general with a heartfelt story. Which is weird, because if you look at anything Family Guy has done in the past 15 years, the word I'd never even think about using was heartfelt. You're pregnant with our baby? I also love the commentary on celebrity culture, with Ted being this big breakout star in the 80s and 90s, but despite being a literal talking teddy bear, eventually everyone just stopped giving a shit about him, and so he falls into irrelevancy. But no, yeah, despite Family Guy for a majority of its run being this horribly fast-paced joke a second kind of show, where they never slow down to try to tell an actual compelling story, I was genuinely surprised to see just how slow of a pace Ted has. That's not a bad thing at all though, as the movie instead of focusing on how to get to the next joke as fast as humanly possible, we get a lot of time for scenes to linger on, so you can really feel the emotion of the characters. And I think that's pretty damn impressive for being a movie about a fucking talking bear who smokes weed. 
And it's not like Ted has nothing to do here. We also have a side plot involving him getting kidnapped by a deranged fan who's obsessed with him ever since he was a kid. And wants to force him to be his son's best friend, who I cannot look at without thinking about that Liam Disney Channel sitcom, Ant Farm. Don't ask me why I know that. Honestly, the weakest part of the movie's plot is that John doesn't even really have to end up sacrificing much in the end. He eventually gets his life together and forces Ted to move out of the house, and lets him know that he can't be part of his life anymore. But after a run-in with the super fan tears him in half, John's girlfriend somehow brings him back to life through another wish on a shooting star, and is now suddenly okay with the idea of John hanging around a teddy bear all the time. Perfect. Glad to see this entire movie was pointless. Probably would have been a better ending to just kill Ted off at the end, but I understand you gotta end your movie on a silly comedic note, and also need to keep the door open for future sequels. Wink wink. And speaking of these aforementioned characters, the breakout star here is most definitely the titular Ted himself, voiced by the one and only Seth MacFarlane. And I gotta say, he did a fucking fantastic job at voicing him here. It's gotta be tough to have your actors give a believable performance when they're acting against nothing, but he knocked it out of the park along with Mark Wahlberg and Mila Kunis. If you've seen Family Guy, you may have noticed that Seth has a very natural way of having dialogue scenes play out, where characters can go off on tangents or stutter their lines. It has a very improvisational feel, which is hard to do with an animated character, especially against pre-recorded humans saying their lines. A lot of the times when recording these live-action CGI hybrid movies, they'd merely have some random guy read out the animated character's lines to the actors, but they went above and beyond here to try and replicate that style of humor Seth likes. What they actually did was have Seth off to the side during filming, so that instead of no-name intern number 40 doing his best Peter Griffin impression, Seth was actually present in real time to talk back and forth, which allowed for a lot more improv, and causes Ted's sound quality to be the exact same as the other actors. You know, it doesn't just sound like he was doing it in a booth or something. But yeah, Ted does a really good job here at not just being some dumb gag. Like, they could have easily filled this movie with Ted doing shitty thing after shitty thing, and you're supposed to sit there and laugh because of how nonsensical it all is. Ha! <laughs> it's a teddy bear who says the fuck word! But he's actually a fairly well-rounded character, who looks out for his best friend and wants to help him settle things with his girlfriend. Mark Wahlberg is great in this movie too. He bounces off of Seth so well. Sometimes you really do forget that he's acting along something that's not even really there. Like Ted, they do a good job at letting you know he's a fuck-up, but not to the point of being unlikable. Like, he's got a good heart and only wants to make sure he can keep everyone in his life, and is trying to balance that to keep everybody happy. The only character here I'm not a fan of is Mila Kunis' as John's girlfriend, Lori. She's a massive bitch. At first, it makes sense that she'd be upset with her boyfriend bumming around with a bear all his life, but sometimes they push it way too far to the point where she's completely unreasonable. And then by the end, she's just like, eh, whatever, we can keep him around, I don't mind. This entire movie could have been avoided then, you bitch! There's also a variety of side characters here, but they don't really amount to much. Johnny has a few friends at his job who get like three lines each, one of them is fucking Joe Swanson. <laughs> Lori has a boss who's hitting on her and he's really just there to give Johnny a reason to continue fighting for her. The best secondary character to me has to be the villain, played by Giovanni Rabizzi? Rabizzi? I don't know. Weird name. He plays that creepy, introverted, psycho kind of guy perfectly. He's also one of the funniest characters here. He's got a lot of great moments. I remember as a kid I lost it at the scene of him dancing in his living room while drinking from the straw. The comedy in general is pretty good overall. I never really laughed out loud, but that also might be because I've seen this movie like 20 times. But when revisiting it for this video, I often find myself finding the small bits of dialogue way funnier than the big gags they try to set up. Just little snarky remarks the characters would make that catch me off guard. I said a bad word one time. Daddy punished me for it. Yeah, it's a great story. I felt like I was there. I think the biggest bit of comedy that comes from it is the fact that there's like a 30 year time skip and Ted is already well known. Nobody bats an eye at his presence. He's treated like any other normal person. So a lot of the stuff I find funny was everybody just treating him like he's not a two foot tall Teddy. A big factor in that is how fucking well he blends into the world around him. I mean, Jesus Christ, these animators went above and beyond in integrating him to this world. To this day, it still remains as one of the best CGI characters in a live action world to me. I love how over the course of time you see him subtly decaying, like some patches of fur being removed or scratches in his eye. If you look at some of the behind the scenes stuff for this movie, you'll see just how much effort went into the animation here. A lot of that is probably thanks to Seth himself, it really seems like he had such a clear vision for what he wanted to do in this movie. And I think that's why it came out as such a solid film. Like, is it the best thing in the world? No, not at all. But for what he wanted to accomplish, I think Seth knocked it out of the fucking park on his first go in writing and directing a live action feature. Also, might I add, the fucking score for this movie goes so hard. It's got that kind of jazzy Frank Sinatra vibe Seth is known for liking. And it surprisingly fits pretty well here. But all this hard work definitely paid off. The movie made half a billion dollars at the box office and got pretty good reviews. I watched it with a friend and they even called it not so bad. So if that's not a glowing recommendation, I don't know what is. 
And with that, Seth had done it. He had successfully shown that not only could he make a pretty good cartoon, not only could he voice act, not only could he sing like a fucking angel, but he could also make a pretty damn good movie too. So what does he do now? He does it again. I was so fucking excited for A Million Ways to Die in the West. Not only is Seth MacFarlane making another movie, but he'll be starring in it. Like, not just his voice, but his face too. His handsome, perfect face, his pearly white teeth, his enchanting smile, his, his eyes that he just got lost in. Anyway, I, I, A Million Ways to Die in the West. I was ecstatic. Could June 6th not come any soon? 12 years old. Still, uh, still couldn't, uh, still couldn't see it. But when I rented it from Extravision a couple months later, I was hyped. It's time to finally see what I was missing out on. It's awful. I vividly remember watching this with my dad in our living room, and by the time it was over, I turned around to see that he had fallen asleep. And when I woke him up, he just turned to me and said, That movie was shit. No, what? That couldn't be true. Well, I liked it at least. Right? I was very much in denial because A Million Ways to Die in the West is unironically, no exaggeration at all, one of the worst movies ever conceived by man. How did this happen? Like, really, how the fuck does one man write, direct, produce, and star in his own film have so much creative freedom and it turn out this bad? Released in 2014, A Million Ways to Die in the West is a film starring Seth MacFarlane as a sheep farmer in the Old West called Albert Stark. After just being dumped by his girlfriend, that's it. The plot just sort of halts at this point for a bunch of unfunny scenes featuring Seth's friends trying to help him get back up on his feet until his new lady's introduced. The wife of the most feared man in the Wild West. She quickly takes a liking to Seth and tries to help him get over his ex. And as you could probably guess, he soon realizes that while chasing this girl, his one true love was sitting right in front of him the whole time. Why is this a western? Apparently this was like a big project for Seth, one that he put a ton of time into researching, as he's supposedly a huge fan of western films. But all we have here is the most basic romance plot we've seen time and time again, except everyone is just playing dress up with their yeehaw clothes. Of course that's where the title comes in, or if there being a million ways to die in the west. <laughs> but this means nothing in the grand scheme of things. All this amounts to is a couple of scenes of people dying in somewhat comedic ways. Like, I don't know, it feels weird using a word like comedic when describing this movie. But all this is here to do is show you how miserable Seth is living in the Old West. But like, you could have just put him in any other shitty living condition and the film would have been the exact same. You may have noticed that I keep referring to our main character as Seth and not what would Albert and that's because this guy is completely indistinguishable as his own character to me he's just how I imagine Seth is in the IRL this has got to be one of the most annoying protagonists in film history all he does for the entire movie is sit around and whine and moan and whinge about how shitty his life is while doing nothing to try and better his situation there are scenes where he just rants and lectures people about how shitty the old west is except he's describing this to people who also live in the old west so this is nothing they wouldn't already be aware of so it just comes off as unnecessary and makes me think that seth imagined ways the audience would find this annoying attitude endearing in some way but the possibility of that is completely shattered because seth does not work as an on-screen star at least not in this i've never seen the fucking orville or whatever it's called he just has this constant smug look on his face like he thinks he's so much better than the situation around him. And because of that, it makes me want him to feel. This may sound like a strange suggestion, but I actually think this role would be way more suited for a Michael Sarah type. His lines remind me a lot of Scott Pilgrim, where in that movie, Scott can sit around to complain about how everything sucks. I find it funny because of how pathetic his delivery is and how pathetic he looks. Sorry, Michael. There are times when I can see glimpses of what he's trying to go for. I actually think a lot of the more quiet talking scenes are pretty decent in terms of the emotion, but then I remember how much of a prick this guy constantly is and my sympathy is gone. He spends the entire movie whining about how he's lost the most perfect girl in the world, but we never see a single scene of them together before the breakup, so like, I don't care. In relation to I don't care, these fucking secondary characters do nothing. Seth put all the attention on himself because none of these other guys do anything remotely important. He has a friend, played by the villain from Ted, who wants to fuck his wife who's the town prostitute. But oh no, she wants to wait until they're married. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? This one man wanted okay. me to smoke a cigar See ya. and then ash on no, his no, like, balls while I, I'm I get, I, him off I get the, what like, the joke was, you don't what? need to keep going on. And the villain has no presence at all. Seth doesn't even fucking meet him until there's like 20 minutes of the movie left. The only thing to note about him is that he's played by Liam Neeson. But I can only imagine this was because Seth was like, whoa. 
I want to meet Liam Neeson. Put him in the movie. This thing is filled to the brim with celebrity cameos that amount to nothing. Jamie Foxx makes a five second cameo, Doc from Back to the Future, Ryan Reynolds, who also makes a cameo in Ted for some reason, but at least there no attention is really drawn to it. Ted doesn't look at him and go, oh my god, are you Ryan Reynolds? Who also makes a fucking cameo in Family Guy, now that I think about it. But here we need Seth to take a detour at the end of a scene to walk over to the barn and have a conversation with Doc Brown. What is the purpose of this other than just, I know what that is. And it never fucking ends. Why in God's name does this silly western movie need to be two hours long? Nothing happens. Scenes will drag out for an eternity. Seth has no idea what the fuck piercing is. Wait, no, yes he does because Ted had great piercing. What the fuck happened here? It's just not funny. Plain and simple. The way a scene works in A Million Ways to Die in the West is that Seth will tell a joke. Then a character will go, what? No, uh. Then he'll repeat said joke, then start to explain said joke. Then a character will fart or shit, and that'll be like the backup punchline in case they weren't giggling at the other shit. <laughs> and when they're not doing that, characters will just sit and talk for minutes on end. They'll just have the most boring conversation imaginable. See, you can make a serious romance movie, or you can make a movie where Neil Patrick Harris shits into a hat for two minutes, but you gotta pick one funny man. I wouldn't mind these slower scenes as much if they just did something visually interesting with them. I'd already mentioned how none of this movie feels real despite them filming in an actual desert. Scenes are way too well lit to the point where you can just tell it's studio lighting. And the costumes, while impressive, are just way too clean, you can tell they just put them on minutes before shooting their scene. Throw some dirt on their shirt, put a tear in his cowboy hat, do fucking something to make this not just look like some dumb SNL sketch. But apart from the visuals, it's just shot lazily. I didn't talk much about it with Ted, but the direction there is actually pretty decent. There's usually a lot of shot variety in scenes, with the highlight being when they do coke with Flash Gordon. There's a nice shot of them sitting at a table, but instead of just having a still shot focusing on each of them while they're talking, the camera constantly pans around them in a circle which helps illustrate how unfocused they are, talking about nonsense, which also helps add to the dizziness of it all, with it almost feeling like the room is spinning, which helps add to that feeling that John is starting to lose track of time. Shot reverse shot. Yeah, I mean, that's just as good. In conclusion, A Million Ways to Die in the West is one of, if not the worst movie I've ever sat through in my entire life, and I take great solace in knowing that I never have to sit through this piece of shit ever again. It helps me sleep at night. Unsurprisingly, this movie did not do well critically, with most pointing out its lack of any good comedy or wit, and it was a big ol' flop at the box office, only managing to rake in $80 million on a budget of $40 million. So I think it's safe to say we won't see Seth star in any new films anytime soon. I've, I've got a tear in my eye, but it's tears of joy. Well, you know, okay, maybe I stumbled on his second attempt. Well, well, stumble is to put it lightly, more like he fucking face-planted. But Ted was still good. Clearly, he's not a total hack. What, what else could he do? It's not like the first one had a perfect conclusion that perfectly wrapped up everything nicely or anything. I was so fucking hyped for Ted, too. I could not wait to watch it when it came out. July couldn't come any sooner. God damn it! Me and my friends all went to the cinema to watch this, and they refused to let us in, so we all had to go and see Minions instead. That was my second time watching it in theaters. Thankfully, when I went home that evening, I decided to watch it on my iPhone 5 through very legal streaming methods, I assure you. And I... didn't like it. 13-year-old me couldn't believe it. Could Seth MacFarlane really make something... bad? I need to sit down. Ted 2 picks up right where the first left off, with John getting married and even Ted himself getting married to his girlfriend Tammy Lynn. This is where we find out that John and Lori got a divorce off screen. She doesn't even appear in this one. Perfect, glad to know that entire last movie was pointless. Apparently Lori was in an early draft of the film when it was about John and Ted smuggling pot across the country, but when the story was changed they had nothing for her to do, and John too I can imagine, which is why they just got rid of her in exchange for a new love interest who was just a clone of John in every way lovely. The main focus is instead about Ted trying to get a sperm donor so they can have a baby. Oh no wait, I mean it's actually about him trying to adopt a child. No wait, it's actually about him trying to prove that he's a human after he's denied adoption which starts fucking up everything in his life since he's not deemed property. No wait, it's actually about him traveling to New York so he can get this big important lawyer to defend his case. No wait, actually it's about the villain from the first Ted movie coming back to try and once again kidnap him. No wait, actually it's about them all visiting Comic Con. Yes, really. My biggest issue with this movie is that it doesn't feel like a movie. It feels like three episodes of a TED TV show slammed together. The pacing here is fucking atrocious. See, when making a movie, or a TV show, it's important to give each and every scene a point. A good comedy movie can make you laugh, but it's even better when it can make you laugh while still furthering the plot in some way. But in TED 2, plot points are picked up and then dropped ten minutes later never to be brought up again. 
such as Ted trying to get a sperm donor. Makes sense to cover that if he's trying to have a kid. But what's the end point to this? That his wife has no eggs left and therefore adoption is the only way. All you need to do to get that point across to the audience is have the scene where they're talking to the doctor and he mentions this. Great, get that out of the way very fast, now we can move on to the adoption stuff so the real plot can kick off. But no, instead we have a two minute long detour where John and Ted try to convince Flash Gordon to be the donor. Then when that feels, we feel the need to have a ten minute long scene of them trying to sneak into Tom Brady's house to steal his sperm. But when that feels, John offers up his own sperm, so we have a five minute long scene of them at the sperm bank where wacky antics ensue. And when they finally get the sperm after twenty minutes of trying, they're told they can't use it rendering the past 20 minutes of the movie pointless i just i just i don't know this movie is filled with shit like this there's no focus at all see the first movie was mostly focused on john he's a human going through a very relatable dilemma so it makes sense why they'd want to put more attention on him in the grand scheme of things ted is just a plot device he's the third edge to this love triangle but in ted too ted is the main star but there's no substance to this story he's just trying to find a lawyer to prove he's not property and john is merely a sidekick trying to help him achieve this while it's true they try to give john his own plot of getting back onto the dating scene it's just so bare bones and emotionless that you can't really care about it it's just here for the formula there is a total of one night scene in this movie and it's when the female John clone sits around a fire and sings this nice song at night. It serves no purpose, but for one whole minute the movie was able to take a breather and relax and not feel the need to shove 50 million jokes in your face at once. <laughs> and speaking of jokes, 50% of them are just reused from the fucking first movie. Like same setup, same punchline, everything. This boss guy from the original, Ted says something fucked up to him because he doesn't want the job, but the boss instead praises him and hires him with some generic tough guy line like, Nobody's ever stood up to me before. I like that. They just do the same joke here. He says something rude and gets commanded. Great, good joke. I liked it the first four times I heard it, but the fifth? Not as impactful. It really just feels like a TV show, relying on the same gags and punchlines because, well, that's what they did the last time. The villain has to do the weird dance to the song again. It was funny in the first one, so it'll be funny here too. Just like it was in A Million West and I in the West, you did the same gag in all three of your fucking movies. Was it really that funny, Seth? I don't understand. It's not like this was accidental. There are lines where characters reference how similar the story beats are compared to the first. John and Ted have a fight, except this one is way more forced. John is talking to Love Interest when he gets a call from Ted, letting him know that Donnie is trying to kidnap him again. So John and Love Interest have to spring into action to rescue him. Oh my god, deja vu. Fuck you. And when they're introducing no jokes, that's the same problem as a million ways to pronounce your very long movie title that is starting to hurt my hands to type out all the time. I mean, f fuck it, anyway. It has the problem where the joke just lingers on and on, and characters just repeating what the punchline is for minutes on end. His name's fuck Scott Fitzgerald? What? No! Well, then what's the F stand for? Francis. No, it's gotta be fuck. It must be it's gotta fuck. Be fuck. 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 Damn. Fuck. It's fuck. All right, I get it. Fuck is a funny word. It's either that or it's just written like a cartoon, like Family Guy, where we'll have pointless cutaway gags that really take you out of it. I seriously don't understand how a film sequel can have largely the same crew, but tonally feel so different. On top of that, Seth's directing has definitely gotten lazier over time somehow. This one is literally just shot in the most boring way imaginable. I keep saying it, but it just looks and feels like a TV show. There's nothing cinematic about it. Unless you want to count the amazing opening sequence that for some reason has the big music number with singers and dancers and jump piano sets and just goes on and on and on and why? It may sound like I'm jumping around from point to point a lot, but I hope you realize that's the exact feeling I got watching this movie. Ted 2 is a film that has no focus, doesn't evolve in any way from what the first established, and if anything, devolved with how the characters like Johnny just reset to the same way they were at the beginning of the original, and doesn't even feel like a proper movie. And as you can imagine, it didn't do well critically, and nobody watched it. Ted 2 only made around half of what the first one did. Seth had mentioned he'd make a third if it performed on the same level as the first one. Ha. Huh. So yeah, he ruined that potential franchise. Wonderful job, Seth. Or maybe not, because it was confirmed that they're looking to make a TV series based on Ted for... Peacock? Who the fuck has Peacock? Yeah, that'll go swimmingly. Honestly, I feel like Ted Tukey might the way it did was because Seth was stretching himself so thin and not realizing his limits, working on both A Million Ways to Die in the West and this at the same time, both of which he did a large amount of the work for, so I can only wonder how different Ted 2 would have been if he fully devoted his time to it. But there's no one to blame for that other than himself. The dude does not understand that he can't do everything all the time on multiple projects and expect stellar results. Your creative juices are going to get burnt out eventually, and that was definitely reflected in reviews and box office reception. And that was Seth MacFarlane's very brief film career. It's a shame, because the guy definitely isn't a hack. When he devotes his time and attention to something, he can make a really good product, evident with the first Tad movie. But before coming back to the world of filmmaking, I'd recommend he get his ego in check, and not expect to do everything himself because he thinks he's God's gift to comedy.
Because this was a fucking slog to get through, and I never, ever want to do it again. This is the last time I ever take requests from the fucking Twitch chat. Are you happy, cheesy memer?